Welcome. My name is Dr. Forrester Dean, and I'm here with my friend Vinzel. And today we're going to be talking about a very controversial topic, and we've already done some stories about this, right? We've done a, a really nice podcast yeah. on spinal stability, and yeah. we've talked about gamma gain. And so what we're trying to do today is to take it to the level of the patient and not so much speaking to the industry, which is usually what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say, Venzel, I'm going to be a little disruptive this time, okay. and because that's sort of what the series is about, yeah. right? Should medicine change? So the point of the conversation is to sort of welcome a, a new perspective, uh, a new vantage point mm -hmm. using real things that are really science yeah. already, right? So I'm not making anything up. Um, we're just putting together information we already have, but the patient doesn't already know these things. And so sometimes, you know, you meet with your doctor, which is what I've done, and the doctor says, oh, well, you have a bulging disc or you have a disc herniation. See here, look on the MRI. You can see it right here. Or sometimes, like many doctors that are treating low back pain cases mm -hmm. can't read imaging, Yeah, right? They can't interpret an MRI or a CT or even an x-ray, so they rely on the report. And so we're not gonna get into that, but the idea is that the, you know, there's a, there's the report can be radically incomplete, mm -hmm. uh, less often that it's inaccurate, right? But it all can also be, can kind of steer the patient in kind of, you know, an emotional place or a place yeah. of worry. And we've talked about that. That was a whole series we did with, uh, with Gamma Gain. Right. And yeah. so you were making this point that if you um, get the patient emotional, right, mm -hmm. and then they bring that emotionality into their... Um, their evaluation. To, right. And they'll, then, they'll have basically all your results and your, your tests will be skewed because they'll be more apprehensive. Um, and when you don't have that trust, especially when you're trying to assess something initially, then you can have skewed results. And then also to your point, with this kind of reporting that seems really damning, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, the report says L4, L5, mm -hmm. disc herniation, extrusion, stenosis, da, 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 so many millimeters, that all looks very scary to the patient and it may skew what they are willing to sign up for when the doctor says, oh, well, we'll just do, you know, we'll do fusion surgery or something. Oh, I'll take care of all that, right? Mm -hmm. So that means the patient doesn't have to actually understand what all that language means when we already know that disc protrusions, disc herniations, mm -hmm. right, are not dangerous and most of the time don't even cause symptoms yeah but it looks scary yes. right or the sound of it to the patient sounds scary so i'm basing most of this series on my personal experience and not the experience of others mm -hmm. so that i'm speaking for myself um, but i've had this ongoing problem with low back pain and i i would say the first time um, anybody looked at it, I was like 35, so I don't want to scare anybody, but you know, that's over 20 years ago. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, my symptoms have been on and off, but in the last five years, I've seen six different doctors, including specialists, wow. four specialists. I've had 13 MRIs done on my pelvis, my legs, and my low back. Mm -hmm. I've had many x-rays. I've been in the emergency room four times. Lots of loss of work. Uh, I've had an EMG. I've had a digital rectal exam, wow. right? So prostate <laughs> exam, right? So just, I guess they're just ruling things out. Mm -hmm. um, nerve conduction test, and I had a s <laughs> sports exam. So that's <laughs> episode one, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you want to know about the, the sports exam, that's just just go back one episode and you'll yeah. see that. Okay, so you're the patient, 
you're, you've come to the doctor, it's maybe your first encounter with the doctor, or we say it's like the first exam. Mm -hmm. They may or may not exam you. That's a different conversation. They may or may not order imaging. That's also a different conversation. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's the doctor's duty to make sure that they look at everything that can contribute to your problem. And unfortunately, most insurance, the, the, the number of things that the doctor can do to sort of understand or diagnose your problem is pretty small. Yeah. Right? So, so first order of business is to order an x-ray which may or might, may not have anything to do with being able to see the problem mm -hmm. on the inside of the body, but it's the first order of business, right? Yeah. And if they may or may not see anything on that, they may order an MRI and they'll look at that and then that's where the problem starts, right? So this is where all the arrows start to point, point towards this you know, complex of what they call a disc bulge or a disc herniation or they may or may not say canal stenosis, which means that the space that the nerve is going through has shrunk. Yeah, Maybe the bone has grown and made the Calcified, space yeah. right smaller, or maybe there's more fatty deposit mm -hmm. in there, and they say it's pinching the nerve. So you may hear, now they can't see a pinched nerve, mm -hmm. but they can see that a, a nerve might be crowded mm -hmm. as it goes through a space, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to keep the language simple for the folks. Um, but basically, none of that is an example of pain, right? So that's a problem. Yeah. So in the, in the articles that my blogs, so you, you want to go to articles 8, 9, 13, 19, and 20. You can learn more about what we're talking about today. Uh, but basically, they say, Venzel, picture equals bad. Mm -hmm. So picture must equal pain. Yeah. Right? So picture equals pain. And that's, that's... They're trying to make a direct correlation where there's not a direct correlation. They're inferring. Right. And, mm -hmm. But it's also easy in the clinic to say, oh, this looks bad, I'm gonna just show this to the patient. Now yeah. that's a shortcut and that's not okay. Yeah. Right? So you're the patient and you say, uh, tell me more, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's assume, so you're saying this as the patient, mm -hmm. right? You say, let's assume, doctor, that everything you're, saying, everything you're saying is true, what else could it be? Mm -hmm. Right, let's not stop here. So. So you have to say to the doctor, let's look at, at everything. Now, if the doctor says this is enough information, mm -hmm. then that's a problem, okay? Now, this is a very short list, and you've never heard of any of these before, but these are all major contributors to low back pain. So this is the other side of the story yep. that the patient doesn't get, right? Because doctors just don't know about these things, mm -hmm. right? Most doctors that you would see for low back pain, a mm -hmm. medical doctor, and mm -hmm. even some specialists have never heard of subthreshold mm -hmm. microtrauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have spoken on that extensively. Exactly. How little small insults in the way you use your body and use your spine or don't use your body or don't use your spine mm -hmm. in increments over time collectively kind of snowball yeah. but it isn't enough to actually cause the patient to recognize that there's a problem it's exactly. only when it kind of hits that, that threshold the th yeah. that threshold right and then they seek care okay symptomatic compensation to associated dysfunction, right? So wow. SCAD, symptomatic compensation to associated dysfunction. That means, for example, my low back pain patient may be having dysfunction of the knee mm -hmm. and is changing the way they go up and down stairs, get yep. in and out of the bathtub or the car, and that has become a symptom mm -hmm. elsewhere than the problem. Exactly. And also with that, you can start to develop coupling too. 
uh, abnormal coupling. Coupling, yeah. right. So that's, so that's when two things that aren't associated mm -hmm. become associated and kind of act together. Exactly. They, they couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, right. Faulty movement patterns. We've spoken yeah. of. <laughs> Extensively. Extensively, right? Yeah. So this isn't some secret information, yeah. right? We put all of this out there for the doctors to learn on the, you know, on yeah. their own, right? Gamma gain. We've spoken <laughs> about that extensively, right? So, yeah. so at this point, like this, this presentation today is a sort of an accumulation of things we've spoken ab about separately, yeah. okay? Sagittal plane overuse syndrome. Yeah. Being stuck, mm -hmm. right? Meaning, not to so say stuck, but activities of daily living mm -hmm. are all in the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. Exercise all happens in the sagittal plane, right? Their sport mm -hmm. all happens in the sagittal, sagittal plane, plane, right? So they go, they, they sit in a chair, and then they sit in their car, and then they go run. Right, and yeah. all of these things are absent of the other missing planes of motion, mm -hmm. which you know we're going to talk about lead to instability of the yeah. spine. Neutral fault, not being able to find core neutral yeah. before you even engage, in get it. up out of the chair, yeah. right, or do your sport, or mm -hmm. exercise, or stretch, or even be you know practicing your yoga. And yeah. not have your core recruited because yoga, you know, most yoga teachers aren't really in that vibe of, of core, core neutrality. Yeah. Sympathetic lifestyle, meaning that your, your, your lifestyle is crazy and hectic and maybe might be stressful or not stressful, but that strain of your scheduling may eliminate exercise. It may eliminate stretching. Mm -hmm. It may eliminate like quiet time, peaceful time, yep. right? Where your back can kind of just calm down a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Um, also sympathetic amplification, which leads to like this hyper pumping of cortisol, yeah. right? Over and over, it's just endless. And what does that do? It, it's, it perpetuates tissue healing failures yep. over and over and over. So, you know, you hear a lot of times you go into the doctor's office, the patient said, yeah, like I was reaching for something and my back hurt like right, ah, like right there. And so they equate their back pain with an event. And so, you know, event based back pain is less than 5% of all back pain. So it's like, even if you were playing tennis, right? Even if you were kicking a soccer ball, even if you were reaching in, in the trunk of your car to pull out the luggage, Yes, they were coupled, mm -hmm. right? The event and the pain, but they have literally 95% of the time nothing to do with that event. Yeah. Maybe that event was, say, like the straw mm -hmm. that broke the camel's, the camel's back, back. Yeah. right? But it, that, but that, it wasn't that exactly. And then, of course, which is the point of today, is to talk to you about instability. Yeah. So I saw these doctors mm -hmm. over and over and over and over, and guess what? I never got a diagnosis. I never got a treatment plan. Wow. When I asked them, what do you think is wrong with me? What's going on with my back? You know what the answer is? I need to refer you. And then the very last time I talked to my doctor, my, my personal doctor, who I like a lot, mm -hmm. he said, there's nowhere left for you to go. Wow. In the system of healthcare, you've run the gamut. You've had, you've actually had the same MRI of your back over the five years, five times. Because wow. we just don't know what to do. Now, I'm going to say this, and this is going to be shocking. What's the number one complaint why people see a doctor or seek care from a doctor? I would say it's pain. 
low back pain yeah. specifically. Yeah. Okay, now, if we can come up with a treatment plan that people could do at home mm -hmm. at low cost, and guess what we did, <laughs> and, but it's not today, but it's coming, right? All right, so in order to understand what's going wrong, I'm gonna steer us in the direction of instability. Now this can be easily understood by the patient. So mm -hmm. let's, let's get there by first, to, let's talk about something super important. If I was gonna ask you, what is the definition of pain? You might say something that feels bad, mm -hmm. it hurts. Um, sometimes it's like a headache, sometimes it feels stabbing, yeah. sometimes it feels achy or dull, sometimes it feels like pins and needles, right? There are all these ways of describing what it is, but where does it come from mm -hmm. and how does it manifest, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. in, in order to understand how to deal with low back pain, you have to understand what it is and where it can come from. So, so your um, turn, pain. Okay. Tell us, tell the folks about pain. Okay, so what pain is and, and all its variations of what it could be. Um, first, I wanna talk about the, the reaction response, which is, for example, someone like, it's checking you, like you're a basketball player uh, and you're backing like down. Uh, yeah, and they give you a nice quick shove. So that reaction response, might be perceived as pain. Mm -hmm. Also, you have harm or potential harm, so something that might cause an injury. So, like even before I check you, you see that the elbow's coming and you might feel pain before I even get there. So you're perceiving the harm before I even touch Because you. I've already had an injury. Yes. And I, I can expect, if, man, if he hits me again. It's gonna fire even if you haven't done it yet. Yep. Right? So the harm and the potential harm. Right. And then also pain can be about the detect and defend mechanism too. So detecting, uh, say for instance, if I take this step and then my body gets in the shape where it won't let me uh, favor that side that's injured, then I have to make a, 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 an adjustment and then that'll go into a faulty motor pattern right. or like, movement pattern. So you're saying like, if I step on a curb mm -hmm. and my ankle starts to twist a little bit, it could be like, ooh, this could get really bad, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're saying like detect and defend is about kind of having your radar out there in exactly. the world mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of blocking or guarding yourself guarding. Yep. from, right, okay. Yeah. And even though it didn't happen, that's still in the definition of pain. Yep. Right? Okay. And then that unpleasant uh, sensory or emotional experience um, is key. So you have to do that throughout your day. That can become draining. That in itself can manifest pain. Like before, like we were talking about earlier, the detect and defend mechanism, tying that in. That if you know every time you take this step on this curve, it's gonna cause some discomfort or pain, then that naturally brings your mood down, that makes you stay in a guarded state even when you don't have to be. Right, because your ADLs change. ADLs yep. are activities the of daily, daily living, living, right? Yep. So you're like, well, I can't go to the grocery store because I know if I get in the car, my shoulder's just gonna hurt like hell, mm -hmm. exactly. right? And then, so you made a point about emotionality, right? What about grieving? Yeah right that yeah. deep sorrow that's it's so emotional and and like that it can al almost give you like a whole body rush of ache mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah so that and that can't be overlooked so the, the the point is that everything you just said had nothing to do with trauma nope. right and so these are all of the things now that's a short list mm -hmm. these are all the things you need to consider, right? All right, so let's move on. Big question here. Can you see, let's say, can the doctor see pain on an MRI or on an X-ray? No, they can't. They, they can't. can't. And that's true. Um, 
does the pain start at the site of the injury? <laughs> no, it does not. It doesn't. Well, it that's doesn't. also true. Mm -hmm. And that may not, not make sense to our viewers. Mm -hmm. Fenzel, does the body experience pain? No, it's the brain. And that's also true, right? So the site of the injury, say, right? So injury to the knee, right? So that's called trauma, right? Evident something, let's say baseball bat, mm -hmm. right? Hits you in the knee. Receptors send a generic signal mm -hmm. through a specific pathway mm -hmm. up your leg, into your spine, up your spinal cord, to the brain, yep. where the brain decides what that is. Exactly. And it's deciding between, is it hot or cold? Mm -hmm. Is it broad touch or is it pinpoint? Mm -hmm. Is it two-point discrimination, mm -hmm. fingers this far apart? or fingers this par far apart. Mm -hmm. It's looking for joint position, right? Yep. I can close my eyes and I can make my arm straight. How do I know that? Can I can it. make my arm 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. How do I know? Because my brain is listening to the joint mm -hmm. alignment, uh -huh. right? So joint alignment, vibration, muscle tone and tension, all these things, mm -hmm. hot and cold, all these things I just mentioned, all of these things, these signals reach the brain faster. Some of them a hundred times faster yep. than pain. So those are all called fast signals. Mm -hmm. Pain is called a slow signal. And even though it's sometimes it's intense, right? We can't say it doesn't exist because yeah. it really does. It's a slow signal. And to tie in with that is that's one of the reasons why we use those as modalities to deal with pain like ice or heat. as therapy yeah so that that's one of the reasons why because the brain pays more attention to those signals exactly yeah. okay and so that will be in our follow-up yeah and we actually touched on this in a previous video too <laughs> i would say <laughs> many times <laughs> okay so let's talk about instability and so i want to bring up instability yeah. in this video because I'm going to say as a, as a practicing doctor, right, is mm -hmm. specializing in low back pain, sports medicine and such. The number one contributor to low back pain is spinal instability. And mm -hmm. so this is a problem for doctors because it's difficult for them to define. Yeah. So I went to my doctor and the doctor said, oh, well, we don't, we're not sure. It looks like you have canal stenosis. It looks like you have a pinched nerve, like that whole business, right? Yeah. And I said, okay, that may be true but I'm gonna say it's not. Mm -hmm. What about spinal instability? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, I don't know about that, right? Yeah. Well, but it could be, right? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Okay, so if you were gonna talk to me about what spinal instability is, what would you say? Mm -hmm. Like, how would you assess that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Obviously, you have a disc herniation, so that's the cause. And I'm going to say, it's not the cause, it's the result. Yep. And I'm going to say something else, and we're going to follow up on this another time. Mm -hmm. The disc herniation can be your body's response to fixing instability and that it's a totally normal reaction that in time will self-resolve. And you heard me say that, and that's all true, yep. right? Okay, instability. Instability in no way means my spine is stuck or it's tight or it's rigid, mm -hmm. right? Instability is a very complex definition, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna read it for you. Yep. Now, where did I get this definition? <laughs> so I made it up. Spinal instability is due to defects and deficits, mm -hmm. and we've talked about that before, yeah. related to these seven things. One, the spinal motor experience. Mm -hmm. Two, 
articulations in multiple planes of motion. Yep. Three, of meaningful and adaptive benefit. Number four, utilizing both aerobic and anaerobic energy systems. Yep. And we've said that many yep. times before. And five, axial spinal loading. Mm -hmm. Number six, while avoiding risk promoting activities of position, duration, intensity, and monotony. And seven, perpetuating certain personal biases and attitudes yeah. about spinal health. And so I can make a point about number seven. Oh, Venzel, don't do that. You're going to hurt, hurt your back. You need to protect your back. Like, don't, I wouldn't lift that. And then I'm going to say, who doesn't love a nice, heavy, juicy deadlift? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and so I, ju I just recently heard this, okay? When your doctor is seeing you for low back pain mm -hmm. and they don't say, how's your deadlift? They don't know what they're doing. Wow. Because if you aren't doing deadlifts, you can't have a functioning spine. Okay, now that, that list of seven things I just gave you is detailed in, in my blog article number 13. Yeah. So it's a little bit too much for us to discuss that here. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is spinal stability isn't A equals B, right? It's not as simple as picture equals pain, it's right? Yeah. It's complex, and we've said this so many times that there's medicine must be a systems based approach. Yep. It has to be. It's so myopic to think that you can tell a patient that, oh, well, look here. Okay, well, what if we don't have an MRI? What if we're in Ecuador? Yep. Or what if we're, you know, we're in a place where you have to wait a year for the MRI? Or what if the local MRI machine is broken? Yeah. Or what if you're with a doctor that's so good that they can say, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. Let me assess your spinal stability. Mm -hmm. Let's look at your deadlift. Let's look at your activities of daily living and make sure you're not all sagittal, yep. right? And I think we can get you out of this in short order. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've got a trick that I use in my office. I've got a couple of them. And I can get you out of back pain right, right now here on the spot. Five, 10 minutes, no drugs. Now that's what I say to my patients, right? So you're free to come to see me. Now I want to make another point here, mm -hmm. and this is about, this, this is a, might be over our audience's head, but this is simple math, okay? There are 16 muscles that are attached from the pelvis to the spine, say the lumbar spine mm -hmm. area, 16, and there are 48 <laughs> muscles attached from the hip to the leg. Now let me say that again. From the spine to the hip, there are 16. From the hip to the legs, there are 48. That's three times more stabilizing muscles in the hip than to your lumbar spine. Say it again. That's three times more muscles stabilizing your hips than your lumbar spine. That's and, crazy. And that's important because ground force reaction comes through the leg to the pelvis yep. first. Yep. So we can almost say low back pain is a consequence of hip instability. instability. Yep. So now what are you going to do? What is the doctor supposed to do now? <laughs> Assess hip stability. Yep. Right now, what I'm trying to point I'm trying to make here is that yes, it's system based, and yes, this is a complex. What I'm hoping that you'll get out of this, and we have a little bit more to say, is that don't settle for simple answers. Mm -hmm. Right? 
you need to find a doctor that's willing and, and able to look at your situation through multiple lenses, yeah. right? Now, now we're gonna blow your mind with two big facts here about low back pain. Back pain is highly associated with quality of life, mm -hmm. specifically to job dissatisfaction. Now, does that have anything to do with an MRI? No. Do I need to take a picture of my patient to ask them about job satisfaction, which no. includes job pay, wages, hours worked, and rest periods for social activities specifically? Then I can understand that the, their lifestyle mm. is contributing more to their back pain yeah. than the disc herniation. I just saved that patient spine surgery. Yeah. And that's a psychophysiological component that you rarely even hear about or even see in an evaluation or an assessment or in the, in the office at all. And I'm, isn't it inclusive? Yes. It's highly inclusive. Right, so what about your patient can't afford an MRI, can't mm -hmm. even afford an X-ray? Can you ask them about job dissatisfaction? And what cost to the patient is that? Zero. zero. Absolutely zero, okay? Mm -hmm. What is the number one comorbidity to low back pain? Smoking. Okay, now, do I need an X-ray or an MRI to know if the patient is a smoker or not. No. I just ask, yeah. don't I, right? Is that inclusive and is that accessible? Yes. Okay, so we just asked our patient two questions that have a higher rel relatable component to their problem than anything muscular or biological or physiologic, yep. right? So if I have a patient who's a smoker and I refer them to a surgical specialist and that surgical specialist says, you need spine surgery right now, it's emergent. And that surgeon never asked them, are you a smoker? Or I can't do surgery on you until you stop smoking for X period of time. Yep. And why does it matter? Because smoking causes inflammation. Yep. And the body isn't going to repair a surgical wound while it's dealing with inflammation. chronic inflammation, right? The body's in a more acidic state, so you're not allowing the body to get into a state of growth. True. Yeah, so... So true. Okay, last fact, Benzel. Percentage of patients walking this earth <laughs> with a lifetime of zero symptoms while they have observable disc herniations, right? Mm -hmm. Bulging discs, canal stenosis, mm -hmm. Their whole lifetime, they, they've had these observable things in an MRI and have never had a complaint of pain, of low back pain. It's around 80 to 85%. Now, did we just make that up? No. Okay, that's in the research and that's in the, the AMA research. Check right? the Carfax. <laughs> Check the Carfax, right? Okay, so closing message, articles eight, 9, 13, 19, and 20. Yeah. We'll break this out for you a little bit more. Podcast on mm -hmm. spinal stability, yeah. right? So it's where we break this all out. Messaging here today. Don't settle for simple answers. Mm -hmm. You need to understand how many more things there are that contribute to pain other than the things 
that can be seen on a picture. Mm -hmm. And if your doctor is shoving a picture in your face and saying, this is it, and that's all you get, and that's the end of your diagnostic journey with them, you need to move on elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Or email me and I'll help you out, no problem, right? I'll, I'll steer you in the right direction of language so that you're speaking the language that your doctor needs to hear so that you'll get the best possible outcomes, mm -hmm. right? Which and the best possible care. Best possible care. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dean. Benzel. We have so much more to say and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>